I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Spark event. Um, we have both some KU students and TCU students here. So I'm glad that you found your way to this room. Um, the program for today or a welcome by me and a little talk about Climate Kick. Then we have a guest who is uh, Jens, who's sitting here in front of me. There will be a small break and then uh, there will be an introduction to mainly for the new Climate Kick students. What is Climate Kick all about? Who are they? What are you going to do? Um, but those who have been in the program for a while are of course welcome to be here and be part of the discussion. Yeah. So the whole idea about this Climate Kick community, which is an EU-funded project, is that uh, we as partners, DTU and the University of Copenhagen, have committed to that we would like to like, catalyze a systemic change for the whole society. And our goal is that uh, we would like to be in a net zero emission economy by 2050. So that is a very clear and ambitious strategy. And I saw this summer a uh, uh, article that Jens was uh, written in, now I can't remember where it was, in Politiken, a Danish newspaper. And I thought that his thoughts fitted, fitted really nice into this uh, climate kick thing and the projects that we are doing with you, because you are all part of this plan. Um, and those who have been in the Climate Kick project for a while know this way of thinking, um, that if you sort of like see that we are now here in 2020, this is a society, how it looks like today. We would like to go through a transformation to be here in 2050. And we need everything that counts to turn this square into this circle. And there's nothing that is better than other things. So there's been a lot of people spinning in here, right, in 2019. So I see a really good movement of people who would like to go here. It's working. But there's still a lot of effort to do because this box is like, it's like a comfortable zone that a lot of people have been to their whole life. And there's a lot of people who don't see the point of this comfortable zone being transformed to a circle. Do you get what I'm sort of like trying to sell? And I think that, I don't know, Jens, are these the people you're talking about or <laughs> a little bit? Yeah, okay. So I would like to welcome Jens to the floor. All right, if you can't hear me at any point, just stop me. Also, if you have questions at any point, stop me. And uh, I'd love to have this as a kind of a debate. I have lots of stuff to share with you. It's super complicated, some of it. Um, so it's great if we can have a discussion, and I'll just speed up at the end if uh, we're running out of time. Um, so the starting point for this was an op-ed that I wrote in the Danish newspaper Polit Politiken. Um, was it a year ago? A year and a half, maybe? I'm not sure. Anyway. The point of it was to kind of call out what I thought was a kind of novel or at least a new phenomenon, a kind of a new form of climate skepticism, 2.0 I called it, just to be fun and have fun with it, um, and used mainly Danish examples. So I don't know, how many of you are Danes? How many of you know a little bit about Danish society? Okay, so there are a couple of you who don't fit either of these two boxes, so I'll try to... Um, make the examples speak to a kind of a more international audience, and I've also tweaked some of the examples that I will, that I will use here. Um, so this came out then, we wrote it, yeah, one and a half year ago or so, and I haven't really given it much thought since then, but then Christina invited me to come and talk about it today, and I was like, okay, wow, that piece is, it's, it's a bit in the back of my mind. So it was actually fun to revisit it and to try to think about it again. Um, so uh, here we go. So, oh. Uh, one minute about me. So I'm a professor of political ecology, and then most of you were like, what? What's political ecology? So I'll give you an example. Um, how many thinks this landscape is looking a little degraded? 
Yeah, there's a couple here. It's actually many who thinks it looks degraded. Why do you think it's degraded? Let's have a quick answer. Yeah. Infertile? No trees. So, political ecology is very, um, kind of arose as a field of study, exactly questioning what are the kind of assumptions about pristine nature that makes us think that something like that is degraded. Many people before you have had the same thought, there should be more trees here. But this is actually a rangeland landscape that has looked like this probably for thousands of years. So, in what sense is it actually degraded? That's political ecology very briefly for you. Kind of questioning everyday assumptions about environment and environment-human relations. We could also have asked the next question, why is it degraded? I'm sure one of you might have pointed to the cows and said, oh, it's because people are grazing it, you know, cutting down trees, blah, 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 blah. That, that suggestion would then lead to a policy remedy of, you know, kick people out and make it into a conservation area, et cetera, et cetera. But you could also ask, why are they grazing? Why are they cutting trees down? Maybe it's because of policies, maybe taxation, maybe other forms of regulation, maybe because of international market pressures that push people into having these practices. Those explanations would then lead to other suggestions of policy changes, right? So that's political ecology. And you will see a resonance between that and what I'm going to talk about today. And let's move then on to an example of climate skepticism. So this is a brief kind of introduction, short movie that'll introduce climate skepticism to you. So how are you feeling about meeting Naomi today? What are you excited about? Well, I was looking forward to meeting you people, and I think recently heard about her. Can you hear? The texting is not good. In so. Sydney, when she was raising real doubts about the motives of some of those on the sceptical side of the argument. Well, I actually lived in Australia in the early 80s. I was a mining geologist working for Western Mining Company based in Adelaide, working in the outback of South Australia. And it was a great time. I loved Australia, loved the work I did. And then I came back to the States and sort of evolved my career into history of science because I was really interested in the question of how scientists decide that they have enough information to say that something is established scientifically. And the accumulated scientific evidence is overwhelming, that the globe is warming, and that the major driver, there are other causes as well, but the mm. major driver is greenhouse gases, of which the most significant is carbon dioxide from mm. burning fossil fuels. So that is, in the scientific community, really in a sense indisputable. And to reject that would be equivalent to rejecting the idea that earthquakes are caused by plate tectonics, or that vaccinations prevent disease. And I'm sure you don't reject those things. So that makes me wonder if the reason you want to reject the science is that it has consequences. It has consequences for us about how we live our lives, how we run our economy, what our taxation policies are, and that's your territory, sure, right? Sure. And so I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. I think that what you don't like are the implications, the political and social and economic implications. But what you've done along with a lot of other people is instead of having let's talk about those implications let's shift the debate let's argue about the science let's keep the debate about the science going because as long as we argue about the science we don't get to this other question about mm -hmm. what it means for us socially economically and politically yeah I, I, obviously the two are linked you cannot separate them and so for people like me having been in public life and in government right if if very significant economic change is being proposed as a mechanism for dealing with a problem. You've got to be damn you, sure. You've got to, you've got to be damn sure <laughs> right. we've got and a real problem here. I agree with here. you about that. I agree that, completely. That, We're talking mm. about a complete transformation of the energy system, right. which is the basis of our economic activity. Mm. So I think you're 100% correct to say we want to make sure that we move mm. forward with confidence that we're basing our decisions on good information. Yep. But here's the thing, mm -hmm. you're not doing that. Because mm -hmm. by rejecting the science, you're actually making a decision on bad information. You're accepting information for people who have their own reasons, motivations for denying the science, motivations that do not come out of problems in the scientific evidence. The people I've studied, one of the things that they feared was a kind of massive government intrusion in our private lives. Yeah. And I agree with them about that. I don't want the government sure. telling me what to do. But the longer we wait, the worse this problem gets. And the longer mm. we wait, the more likely it is that we're going to have to do things that you don't like. If we start doing it now, we can have an orderly transition. If we wait until we have a crisis, then there's going to be panic. And then I think it's going to be much worse. And then I think mm. you're going to see a lot of government interventions that you don't want to see at all. Okay, so this was a brief introduction to this issue. 
And now I'll try to come back to my slideshow, which I didn't manage to do. So sorry about this. Here we go. Can you imagine I've been a teacher for like 15 years and I'm still <laughs> So this, what you saw was a Harvard professor of uh, science, technology studies, and I think environmental history, confronting someone who's like basically a climate denier. Did you get a sense of how she explained, how she tried to poke at, his, at the climate denialism? What was the kind of issue there? Why did she imagine that he's denying the science? Yeah? I think she was addressing like, yeah, she said like the consequences, so she was addressing the fear the guy had of tackling like very difficult complex systems like the political and the economical problems that it will have that we, when we need to transform into different energy sources and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so she was basically saying if you accept the science, you probably worry that you will have an economic transformation in a direction you don't want. So then that's the reason for why you are rejecting the science, which is a poor reason to reject the science, right? You could argue. So nothing to do with the validity of the science. And um, Naomi Oreskes, as her name, she wrote a whole book about this phenomenon of, and, and how climate denialism has been kind of promoted or at least strengthened through industries especially the fossil fuel industry, that, is, that have seen itself as standing to lose from effective climate mitigation regulation. And it's called Merchants of Doubt. And if you're interested in this issue more broadly, I can, really, I can strongly uh, recommend that book. So we can characterize this issue of climate denialism or climate skepticism, as I call it. It's been characterized in different ways in literature. And here's an example by a guy called Ramsdorf, who kind of identified three types of skepticism. So there's trend skepticism, which is about um, denying that the temperature, the global average temperature is actually increasing. There's human, uh, sorry, attribution skepticism, which is about denying that it is anthropogenic. So these are two kind of classic forms of climate denialism, right? I'm sure you've all seen them and recognized them and probably debated them with friends or you know, have seen them in the media or debated for, for decades. What I was trying to poke at with climate skepticism 2.0 was the third type that is mentioned here, the consequences of climate change, impact skepticism. So the notion of you know, downplaying how fast is this gonna move, how dramatic are the effects gonna be, and how, what are we going to do to turn it around, to change or try to abate uh, climate change through mitigation? And, sorry, is that my phone? No, thank God. Um, and another two people here wrote recently about this, an article that I found in, while preparing uh, for this talk, uh, calling it a new form of denialism, again speaking to the same issue, how the fossil fuel industry and political leaders assure us on one hand that they understand and accept the scientific warnings of climate change, but are in denial about the consequences of the scientific reality in terms of policy or by continuing blocking progress in less visible ways. And I think that's really what's interesting about talking about climate skepticism 2.0, as I call it, is that it's less visible the kind of original forms of client denialism, we could easily recognize, right? People saying, oh, it's a hoax. It's not man-made, it's just natural fluctuations, the sun, blah, 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 right? It's easy to recognize, but in here, what we're hearing is instead, yes, climate change is real, it's horrible, it's gonna be, you know, demanding drastic transformations of our society, so here you go, here's the 1% fuel tax for the next 10 years, right? More difficult to realize that, that, that something is going on here which is not corresponding to the actual transformations needed. And that is, I think, the kind of problem of this new form of denialism. So I tried to kind of define it uh, myself and I redefined it in the process of translating it in from the original Danish text into English. So my own view on this is that it is skept climate skepticism 2.0. It's something that systematically downplays the risks and challenges associated with global warming and closes down debate about what mitigation actions are needed, but also not only needed, but also possible. So it's about denying the full consequences of what's happening, and it's about downplaying what we need to do to react in sensible ways. 
And there's a couple of kind of broad examples of this or kind of ways that this can play out. So downplaying risk and costs, labeling policy suggestions that align with, for instance, the Paris Agreement goal as completely unrealistic, political pseudo-action, I'm sure you've seen this before, declarations about action that are happening alongside inaction or contradictory action, as per the example I gave you a minute ago, or rhetoric that limits the space for, for instance, unilateral country-level action, saying that, oh no, if Germany regulates its car industry, the whole industry is just going to move to China and that's going to make the problem even worse. That could be true, but it could also be false, right? Depending on how we imagine the global economy and the possibilities for collaboration between nation states. I'll come back to all of this. This is all introduction still. So don't be bored yet because there's a lot more coming, guys. Um, so I think the danger of this and why we should care and why we should think about this and why we also I urge you to try and think about this is because it's difficult to discern than the outright climate denialism. So it's politically actually somehow more dangerous, right? Because it can lull us into sleep, right? And it kind of stifles meaningful discussion about what mitigation actions are necessary, effective, but also possible. Some mitigation actions are simply taken off the table before we even start talking. Contributes to inaction and a sense of confusion. I meet that, I see that almost every day when I meet people who've been, you know, subjected to these kind of climate uh, skepticism. People are confused. Why can this politician say that all we need to do is change this little tax on vegetables when then you have this leftist activist saying that we need to totally transform capitalism? What's going on here? And in, in the end, all of this, I think, increases the risk of disastrous climate change. Let me try and give you some examples of how this plays out. So, how many knows this image? Anyone? who's interested in climate but doesn't know that image. It's a great report, I think, that came out in October 2018 by the IPCC. It's, called, it's kind of been known as the 1.5 degree uh, report. And it, I, as it was commissioned by the UNFCCC after the agreement, uh, the Paris Agreement was made, exactly to try and explore. So, because the Paris Agreement has two goals, right? 1.5 and 2. And it actually says we should try to come as close to 1.5 as possible. And, um, so at that time, this report was commissioned to say what is going to be the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees in terms of projected impacts. And uh, the report illustrates that the differences are quite stark, and I'll show you a little bit about that uh, later. Um, and it's some of those differences. This is just a small kind of me cherry-picking, you could argue, of some of those differences right, between one and a half, two degrees. One is that sea levels are going to be slightly higher, 10 centimeters at two degrees than 1.5, and that's going to have projected consequences for around 10 million people. Coral reefs, which will have a little bit of at 1.5 degrees, according to predictions, are going to be wiped out more or less completely at two degrees, and so on and so forth, right? So we get a sense that 1.5 degrees is better than two, but it's not good, right? We get a clear sense of that. And there's drastic consequences for a lot of people, right? That's pretty clear. So the Paris Agreement goal are not random. Of course, they're politically set, but they are set for a reason. I'm not going to go into this. This is just another argument for why keeping the temperature, the global warming to uh, 1.5 or maximum 2 degrees is a good idea. And this is basically the point about tipping points and how multiple tipping points in the global system a climatic system can come together and introduce uh, an irreversible uh, state of change in the Earth's climate, right? That is going to be difficult to get away from again. Some call it the hothouse Earth effect. And Catherine Richardson, who is a professor at KU, was one of the people who's been looking into this. Just another argument for why the temperature goals are maybe, you know, a good pointer to what we want to be aiming at, right? Yet, there are people who argue that higher levels of global warming are optimal. Um, do any of you know this guy? No? Okay. Yeah, that's one of you. So this is William Nordhaus. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics, I think in 2018. Do you know? Was it 18? Yeah, I think it was 18. Um, for, uh, so he was one of the first people who developed the type of model that has then become the IAM models, the Integrated Assessment Models, 
that uh, the IPCC also uses. So he developed that back in the 80s and now he got the Nobel Prize uh, for that work. So he believes that um, the optimal level of global warming is not, you know, 1.52 degrees, not that the IPCC is saying that. They don't say that it's optimal. But he argues that the optimal level of warming is actually 3.5 degrees of warming. So how does he arrive at that um, conclusion? So Op optimal, up, optimal sorry? in terms of what? In terms of, in an economic sense, where the marginal cost equals the marginal benefit mm -hmm. of allowing for the global warming. Okay. So it's a classic, for yeah. those of you who are economists, way of looking at the world, an equilibrium model. And how does he get to that uh, result? So first of all, he has what's called a discount factor, fa factor which is projected on the notion that in the future we will, have, we will have continue to have economic growth in the global level if, among other, we allow for further temperature change, if we allow for fossil fuels to be extracted from the ground. That economic growth will make us all wealthier. On that basis, it makes sense to say that incomes in the future should be discounted if we, um, if we think about them as the net value of that income. But also he introduces an impatience factor saying that the incomes of future generations should be seen as less important from the perspective of the present, irrespective of this growth. The implication of that is that large costs in the future are seen as less important in the present, for decision making in the present. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, I realize you're probably not economists, so I guess I should have thought a little bit more about this. Anyway, I hope you'll bear with me with this. Another thing is he, he has a damage function where he estimates what is going to be the damage, the costs of further global warming. And that cost function is based on some research that I'm not going to go into detail with here, but if you're interested, you can shoot me an email and I can send you some links. But he finds that at three degrees of warming, we will have damages of around 2.1% of GDP. At six, percent, six degrees warming, we will have damages of 8% of GDP. So just off the top of your heads, does that sound reasonable? Does anyone find it unreasonable? You find it a little bit unreasonable? <coughs> Six degrees of global warming. Have any, any of you ever read about what that looks like? It's absolutely nonsense. There is so much uncertainty and you can't really tell. My yeah, uncertainty, I think, is a good point here, yeah. I think at the point of six degrees warming, the 8% won't matter anymore because it's like unlivable anyway. Yeah, there are major parts of the planet where you just can't, anymore, you can't step outside of your aircon anymore. Yeah, definitely. I think it's reasonable if we look at the huge permafrost areas, they could be used then. They could be what? They could be used for the permafrost areas. And a lot of cold areas that could be livable, they're not livable now. I mean, it makes sense that it's not such a high um, decreasing. Okay. I urge you to read some of the studies that have been trying to guess at this. They, are not, they disagree with you, I think. Anyway, so another thing that this model, uh, how this model arrives at this result is that, uh, of course, these are equilibrium models. So for those of you economists will know, they ignore these tipping points. So he doesn't model the tipping points. Uh, that we just talked about as a reason for why the temperature goals in the Paris Agreement are important. So to me, this is a kind of classic example of climate skepticism 2.0, whereby something, whereby through making a model uh, with a lot of hidden assumptions, some of the assumptions that I've just talked about here, makes it appear as if higher global uh, temperatures, average global temperatures, are something that's amenable, something that we can handle, something that will not cause major damage to ecosystems and people around the world. And I can tell you that Nordhaus's work has been used, this is just from a Danish debate, but if you go to English spoken news sites, you will find lots of uses of Nordhaus models as a kind of key argument from particularly liberal, liberal and right-wing think tanks, conservative think tanks, um, to argue for let's wait with making uh, policy, mitigation policy decisions because as Nordhaus says it's going to be too expensive and we can manage these future costs as we go. Yeah? I, I just want to make sure, did he win a Nobel Prize for that model? 
he won a Nobel Prize. So I, I've actually been looking into this. As far as I can see, he won the Nobel Prize for his development of the model, the way of modeling the global economy together with the climatic system or the biophysical system. It's called the DICE model he developed. He developed that back in the 80s, I think. But you, that model can tell you different things depending on what values you put into it. If you put the lower discount rate, for instance, you will get a different result. Okay. If you have a different... It's not necessarily the results he got the Nobel Prize for. No. But of course, now, in 2018, <laughs> all, these, all these people in the public debate who don't like climate mitigation action argued that he got the Nobel Prize for his results and that we should take his results as a higher fact because he just got that prize. So that's why I bring him up now because he was just brought out uh, in, the, in the kind of policy debates about climate change also in Denmark uh, a year ago because of this Nobel Prize. So another kind of favorite, um, any questions? Feel free to, shh, okay, yeah. Has he spoken out on the issue himself about how he's being used in these debates? Yeah, I mean, he is, uh, he stands by his model results, right? But if you read his, so I can share again, if you send me an email or something, if you read some of his conclusions, he's a little bit ambiguous in the conclusions. But these are his results. I mean, the data that I'm showing you, the 5% and blah, 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 2% or whatever, are direct quotes from his papers. So. Um, I mean, that's also where he got his uh, data to start with. Also. Exactly. Exactly. So you can see, so one of the, his damage function, I can tell you very briefly, is based on surveys in localities, like small localities with different temperatures. And then he looks at, you know, what is the economic output in this area? Uh -huh. But he, of course, does not have any data on global climate change because it, you can't get that data, right? It's, he's modeling the future. So there's a lot of criticism, of course, of those aspects of his models, et cetera, et cetera. So. You had a question? Yeah, you kind of answer it. Like, uh, I mean, is, is it possible to include these kind of variables in terms of tipping elements inside the model? In, in the tipping elements? Yeah. Not really, because equilibrium, are you an economist? No. General equilibrium models are, you know, basically premised on trying, on, on what's it called? Convex curves, concave curves. So they will go towards an equilibrium. But tipping points is exactly about the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So within his model structure, no, he could not model tipping points. I, don't, I, I mean, there are some, if you are interested in tipping points, there are some studies now that are trying to create a heuristic framework to think about them. How do we think about you know, risk when we do not know when it's, um, how does it okay, what creates the, what, what, you know, um, creates the bad outcome and when it will happen. So there are some papers out there that try to model it, and obviously they come to the conclusion that we should mitigate much more strongly and we should have a much higher price on carbon than the studies such as um, Nordhaus. But it's difficult to risk because of the nature of the you know, probability system. So. Okay, so another example of what I call climate skepticism 2.0 is Bjorn Lomborg. You won't be surprised, I'm sure, if you know him. And um, he, his argument presently is, is very much that growth should, become, should come before climate change. So kind of similar argument as Northhouse. And um, he bases his argument, among other, in this article, if you look at the lower part, on a quote from the IPCC. You see here, according to the IPCC, the overall impact of global warming by the 2070s will be equivalent to a minor loss in average income. So that then becomes his argument for why uh, we should uh, focus on growth instead of climate mitigation. Again, the argument that we will become richer in the future so we can kind of manage our way easily out of whatever problems climate change will, will, um, will result in. But if you look at where he finds the quote in the IPCC uh, report, you will also notice that <clears throat> they write exactly as per this issue with the tipping points that many of the estimates do not account for catastrophic changes, tipping points, and many other factors. Some of the things that would make us argue for why we should be risk averse, right? And that losses are likely, more likely than not to be greater rather than smaller. 
and that losses accelerate with greater warming and that irrespective of whether you believe that the aggregate loss will be as it is, poor and vulnerable populations will be severely negatively impacted. I'm sure you also know that, that all projections of how this is going to unfold say that people who live in poor regions are the ones who are going to be hit the hardest, right? So that is interesting, I think, in relation to Lomborg's narrative because he argues that we need growth now instead of mitigation action exactly out of a concern for poverty alleviation. So he argues that cheap energy is important for growth and growth is important for power, poverty reduction. Climate change impacts are going to be limited anyway and we can decouple the economy from the environmental impact. If you look at what others are saying, they're saying that climate change impacts would exactly hurt the poor more than others. So if growth is really what we need to alleviate poverty, then it's a poor argument when climate change is going to hit their poor in particular, right? And what we also see is that growth is tightly correlated with greenhouse gas emissions and it delivers less and less presently by way of poverty alleviation. So what we see globally right now is that the benefits of growth are falling disproportionately on more wealthy classes. Uh, I don't know if you know of that research, but... And what we also can see globally if we look at... Um, if we look at income distribution and wealth distribution globally is that we can actually alleviate a lot of poverty through redistribution. So growth is not per se necessary for further poverty alleviation. At least there's a huge gap uh, where we can alleviate poverty without inducing further growth at the global level. And the risk of climate tipping points increase with warming, etc., etc. The same kind of arguments that I've made before. So if we just take the first points here, cheap energy is important for growth and growth is important for poverty reduction. It's just one example, you could have given a million examples, right? This is one way in which you can illustrate global inequality in how present energy is used and the, and the possibilities for redistribution, right? So this shows electricity consumption, for different uh, regions for different purposes. And what you can see is that, for instance, um, gaming in California uses as much electricity as the entire country of Ghana, right? Um, and California pools and hot tubs is around the energy use of electricity in Nepal, or not energy use, but electricity use of Nepal. It's just indicative of a potential for redistribution. If you go to global data sets on energy use and electricity, you can see how this falls through, falls in categories in different countries, which countries use how much. This is just a kind of a fun for a spark event illustration of this inequality. And researchers have demonstrated the enormous potential of change, changing expenditure, public expenditure patterns in states, but also redistributive measures between income classes, basically arguing that we can end this, this particular set of researchers argue for three-fourths of extreme global poverty that can be ended right now if we um, redistribute and allocate uh, defense expenditures and energy subsidies. So they're not even arguing that, they're not even saying that we have to have no defense expenditures. In this case, they argue that the defense expenditures of a nation should be lowered to the lowest level of the neighboring nation. So it's that gap in defense expenditures. So for instance, if, you know, India and Pakistan to neighboring countryside. If Pakistan uses 2% of its GDP and India uses 1 GDP, they're arguing to take the 1% that Pakistan is using more, Pakistan is using more than India, and put it into poverty reduction. With that shifting around, we can end two-thirds of poverty today. Which is interesting, right? Given the strong argument that we need more growth, which is very closely linked to climate, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, to end poverty. Just another basic, you've seen this figure before? Yeah, so you know the argument, right? The second part of Lombard's argument is that we can decouple the economy from its climate impact. And that in the future, we can have better technologies and be more wealthy. So if we don't do it now, we can definitely do it in the future. Let's again look at what, you know, different types of evidence show. Here we have an article basically saying the same thing. It's arguing that countries such as, oh, Denmark is not there, Germany, Sweden, and the UK have had decoupling. What you see in the blue figure is GDP. What you see in the um, purple is greenhouse gas emissions. 
So is this is what would be called absolute decoupling, right? GDP goes up, emissions go down. They don't, they don't grow slower than GDP, they actually go down. It's called absolute decoupling. Any idea, if, is, this, is this because of technology? Or what's happening behind you? Uh, no, it's because most of our pollution is um, imported to other countries. So the country itself might not have as much CO2 emissions, but we, all our products are then produced somewhere else and have a yeah. higher CO2. So it's partly, as you say, it's partly because the uh, UNFCCC's accounting system uses the so-called territorial principle whereby it's production-based emissions and not consumption-based emissions. And some of these countries have moved their production elsewhere and voila, they're able to decouple. It's not only that, it's also actual mitigation actions in these countries, right? But it's partly because of this. Is that clear to everyone? It's a very important point because we constantly hear this. Danish political debate, open a newspaper every day, you see this said again and again. We can decouple, decouple, decouple. If we look at the global level, we don't really see a lot of absolute decoupling, right? We see these are the emissions over time. And actually, interesting if you think about it, the only time in the last, what, 60, 40, 60 years that we've seen global CO2 emissions actually go down, you're all smiling. Have you seen this before? Is that why you're smiling? No? How many know this figure? So some of you have seen it. Okay, it, the only time we've seen it actually decrease is after the second oil shock. That was the Iranian revolution and oil prices tripled overnight. And after the global financial crisis in 2008, the worst recession in decades, right? Uh, since the Second World War. So indicative of the kind of challenges of decoupling, right? If we go to material use, so we kind of lump together biomass, minerals, metals, and fossil fuels in one category and see how much are we taking from planet Earth as a kind of indicator of metabolism of the economy globally, we see an even tighter, um, we see an even tighter correlation between GDP and, um, and fossil, and sorry, and, uh, and materials use or environmental footprint. So what we can see here is actually that material use is, is rising faster than GDP growth, right? So that's the opposite of a decoupling. It's recoupling. Any idea why this is happening? Anyone? It's, yeah. It takes more energy than before to, um, you know, extract the same resources. Yeah. The resources are not as accessible anymore. It's partly because of that. It's called the E-ROI, e E-ROI, E-R-O-I, yeah. So it becomes more difficult to get the minerals out of the ground. We use more fossil fuels to do it. Anyone else? Other explanations? There's one very powerful also explanation. And it links back to what you said. We've moved our industries away from the areas where we have strict environmental regulations, right? That's why all the ch crap you can buy in Tiger in Copenhagen is so cheap. It's because production happens in places where, for a multiple reasons, environmental regulations are not as strict. So we've actually seen a drop in efficiency of production, global production of value over the last decades because of this shift in in the global uh, economy, to, uh, geographical shift. Um, yeah, so there's no decoupling even in wealthy countries if we look at consumption-based educators. So the evidence for decoupling, which is a fundamental part of, of um, Lomborg's argument, is just not there, right? Not in the indicators that matter at the global level. Not there. Furthermore, the future technological fix is already part of the calculation, right? We're already going to need a lot of technology. So do you know these figures from the same report, the IPCC 1.5 degree report? Basically, they show us a trade-off between uh, reducing emissions now and waiting a couple of more years. So I know it's not very clear. I'm sorry. You can get these slides afterwards. In P1 here, we, this is global emissions every year in the y-axis, the x-axis is years. Here we see in 2020 emissions go down. And then we go below zero, but not that much below zero, right? Over in P4, emissions start going down maybe, is that 2030 or something? And then we go way below zero, way, way, way below zero. How do we do that? We do that through technology, different 
you know, some of them are existing today, some of them are more or less imagined, but um, the important point is here, none of them exist nowhere the scale needed, right? Nowhere near the scale needed. This is 20 gigatons of net negative emissions, implying that if we have positive emissions, we need to suck out those positive emissions plus 20 gigatons per year. Right now, we emit 40 gigatons. You can imagine the scale of, of what we'll have to build, the industry will have to build to do this, right? It's not small stuff. So we're already relying on a technological miracle, right? So by waiting with cutting our emissions, as Lomborg suggests, suggests we're just going to need more of that stuff. It's going to have another, you know, 20 gigatons. This is just to get you a sense of what, what this looks like. So this is the, in Australia, it's called the Gorgon facility, I think. It's the world's largest to be. I don't know if it's built. You can check on Google. I haven't checked lately. It's being built in Australia. It's supposed to be the biggest CCS, carbon capture and storage facility in the world. When it's operating at, at scale, I think they imagine around four to five megatons of uh, CO2 that it can, you know, push down into the, uh, into the ground per year. 20 gigatons, 4.5 megatons. We'll need around four or 5,000 of these, right? So it's a huge industry we have to build. And remember, that industry does not, you know, take care of babies. It's not hospitals. It's not childcare. It doesn't produce anything of value in itself, right? The CCS technology. It's just cleaning up. Yeah? Do we have a comparison of how much carbon is released while building this huge site? I'm sorry? I, I didn't... How much carbon is emitted while building that? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. There are actually estimates by the um, EIA, or the International Energy Agency, IEA. They've, they've uh, tried to calculate the carbon budget for building the renewable energy industry. And, I mean, I haven't looked into it enough so that I will, you know, tell you that I know this for a fact. But as far as I read what they're writing, it corresponds pretty well to the remaining global carbon budget for the one and a half degree. We have around 500 gigatons of, of CO2 left for the one and a half degree uh, temperature goal if we do not want to have a lot of negative emissions. And as far as I can read the reports, that's what we're going to need to just build that infrastructure, the renewable energy infrastructure, not the CCS. So, I mean, the numbers don't really add up, right? Unless we can somehow develop an, a wild technological, you know, thing that can help us. So that's why, I mean, that's why what I would call Björn Lomborg's work is, is climate skepticism 2.0, right? But you have to know all this to know. And that's why it's so dangerous, because it's not very visible. And that's why we need a whole army like you, who can go out and meet in you know, the public sphere and debunk these claims constantly. Danish politicians still believe you know, we need growth. Otherwise, we cannot. I mean, this guy up here, the former climate minister, he was like, without growth, we'll never change. We'll never you know, solve climate change. Like, it's a requirement that, that a very rich nation continues to grow its economy. If you look at the data on this, it's completely off charts, right? And the, the current minister still, you know, caught up in this economic growth as a prerequisite for solving the climate crisis. Here's an example of another form of what I call climate skepticism 2.0. This is from Norway. Anyone here from Norway? What a shame. I thought this is not Danish. Finally, I'll get some resonance with people. So, but this is from Climate Schizophrenic Norway, as I say, because on one hand, they have some pretty nice pledges, right? They're going to be climate neutral by 2030. They'll have a low emission society by 2050. And they're reducing a lot up here. On the other hand, they're going to continue to pull oil out of the ground until at least until 2070. And if you look at what we're supposed to do globally, we're supposed to go net zero around 50, right? So it doesn't really add up. And production will increase on t at least until 2023. Recently, if you remember, there was, before the fires in Australia, there was fires in the Amazon. Do you remember who got the blame for that? Macron. Macron, did he get the blame? Oh. Bolsonaro was blaming Macron. Ah, Bolsonaro, here we go. Yeah. I think Bolsonaro was the main person, right? Maybe Macron also got some blame. But Bolsonaro, I think, was the person who really got the hammer, right? Anyone here from Brazil? No. 
But he really got hammered for that, right? How, you know, this right wing, you know, how could he, you know, be so out of control? Norway has the world's biggest uh, forest-based climate mitigation funding activity going on, among others sending a lot of money to Brazil. Immediately they did the only thing responsible, right? Which was to say we're going to cut support to Brazil, right? Look what Bolsonaro said. Immediately he calls out the hypocrisy, right? Who are they to say that I cannot promote the economic development of my citizens and my country while they are still pulling oil out of the ground? And I think that's, again, one of the reasons why this, you know, uh, why this rhetoric is so dangerous, because if we don't act, those of us who have the resources and responsibility to act, but continue to, you know, circle around without doing anything, other countries will not act either, right? And for good reason. So another example from Denmark again, I'm sorry about that. So recently the Danish government pledged, pledged that we will have an increased climate uh, development aid. Development aid on, in relation to the climate, right? More financing of adaptation and mitigation in developing country. But behind the surface, development aid is hitting the lowest level in 40 years. My guess is that the countries who receive this aid and who Denmark is negotiating with at the COP process know this, right? But again, you have to look under the immediate rhetoric to see what's going on. And to me, again, this is also an example of, uh, in the end, um, climate skepticism 2.0. Because if a country that is so wealthy and has such a big historical responsibility as Denmark is not willing to really lead the way, how on earth can we imagine that other countries lead the way? Will, we'll, you know, mitigate? I don't think we can. So are Danish politicians not saying that they have given up? Is that the conclusion that we should make? You know, that you know, no country is going to do anything anyway, so we might as well not give them development aid to try and urge them to do something? Or well, what's the underlying you know, political analysis here? We don't know. But I think this is deeply problematic, right? Please, you know, interrupt. I don't know whether you are thinking that I'm slightly insane or <laughs> just trying to follow my arguments or what's going on. Here are another couple of examples. Denmark is also an oil producer and a big agriculture producer. And there's been, in the debates about whether we should stop producing oil and regulate agriculture, a major argument has been, if we do this unilaterally, production is just going to move elsewhere. The Saudis are just going to produce more oil and the Polish farmers will just produce more pork. So it doesn't matter what we do. Do you agree to that logic? What could be a counter argument? Yeah? It's in society, I think it will be the thing. I'm sorry? It's in society, not to consume that thing. That's, a, that's an interesting point. What about demand? Is demand unaffected by supply? We don't know, right? It's an assumption here that it is. Demand is just going to grow. So if we don't supply it, someone else will. But who knows? Yeah, exactly. We're actually behind you because you haven't said something else. Uh, I think it's, as you said, it's about uh, leading the way and showing like this, uh, how it can be done. Yeah. Because not much countries have the expertise as Denmark, especially in this field. So someone has to take the first step. Yeah. And although if, if it, this, um, the first five years, Demand is going to shift. It's more an investment in the long term to say. Yeah. And maybe anyone else who wants to say something about this? Did you want to add? Was it the no, same? No, it was similar. Yeah. Same. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is actually going to change demand. Or maybe other countries will do the same. Because if the Polish you know, agricultural ministry decides, OK, Denmark is regulating its agriculture, so will we. We'll follow their leadership. Then Danish farmers will not move to Poland, right? But again, if Poland does not do this, if no other countries follow suit, then the arguments in Denmark are correct. Then production will probably move. But then the climate change is also going to go disastrous, right? So you can only have this argument that production is just going to move if you think you know, that Paris Agreement will never be fulfilled. Otherwise, you cannot have that argument. And that assumption is never put out in the light in the open debate, right? But that is, I, in my view, the, the underlying assumption, right? 
Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Yeah? And the other way is try to find a cheaper green energy source or a cheaper way to produce meat on the other side. Like a more climate effective. Exactly. Yeah. To make it more climate effective yeah. and cheaper. Yeah. Then, then I think those should be the arguments, right? And this is the point. Yeah. This is the point of, sorry, I, I, mean, uh, this is, I think this is the main objective where to arrive, to make something uh, sustainable. Yeah. Or even for meat or oil, maybe just drop it, right? Because we don't need it necessarily. Yeah. Thank you. Did you want to say something else? Yeah, it was in relation to that, that maybe Denmark has been leading the way in terms of wind energy for the past 40 years. And a lot of people have been saying, like, it doesn't even matter because we're such a small country. But we have also been fine-tuning a technology which is now cheaper than oil yep. in two yep. uh, of the world. Yep. Um, so that's also a way of like, changing the, the whole yep. market and new technologies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, while in these two supply-side situations, Danish politicians are like, what we do will have no effect outside the country. Yet every day we hear Danish politicians say, what we did with wind has had a major effect globally, right? And I think it's those assumptions and it's those inconsistent arguments that we need to kind of start questioning. Do you want to say something? Um, yeah, I, was, I was just thinking about it. It was kind of similar to how what's already been seen in, in timber production, because more and more countries have regulated uh, timber production. So what you saw was like a bottleneck where like um, fewer and fewer countries supplied uh, timber. And now it's basically just down to like Brazil and Indonesia. Um, but you could kind of see maybe a bit out into the future on how the market respond there, because now I know there's a lot more where sustainable timber production have arisen in like Sweden, for example, and um, yeah. Yeah. But it is something that has been seen. Yeah. Yeah, that you can lead the way by example. Yeah. Also, just think about Greta Thunberg, right? A good, a good example of how leading by example might actually change things. Yep. But regardless of the demand maybe staying the same or being higher or whatever, don't you think there will always be someone who doesn't follow the lead and then kind of milk that they can do production the old fashioned, easy, Definitely. whatever like Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not completely sure about this, but as I understand, like the, the blind tax that is introduced in Europe, like Denmark was not a part of this, yeah. even though everyone else was. And now uh, Copenhagen Airport is expanding because all the Swedes yeah. are going to fly from, from Copenhagen now. Yeah, that's a great example. So, of course, of course, you will have those effects. There will always be countries who will not you know, join the boat. But again, if we don't try, if we give up, then we should say it, right? Politicians should then say, okay, we don't think this is going to be solved. So instead of trying, instead of using resources to try and mitigate, we're just going to start building dikes and, you know, whatever. Right? Because right now they're saying that they're trying, but there's also a lot of indications that they might not be trying that much. So I think what, what I would like you know, what I want to use this kind of analysis for is to kind of, we need to have those assumptions, underlying assumptions and ideas about the world up in the open so we can discuss them. But don't you think that maybe like legal action is a more like direct way of hitting everyone? So like sure. Just Let's take that briefly. Remember that legal action between states is super difficult, right? There's no sovereign. So in the end, you can have trade sanctions or what especially the US has done a lot, invade other countries to impose your will on them. And um, yeah, I mean, that could be in the end the consequence, right? So uh, let's invade Poland, you know, and just tell them no more pork production. I don't know. Um, my argument is we should try and in induce collaboration, right, by showing the way. But you, the other way is definitely a possibility, right, that there will be very negative sanctions to some countries. And sometimes scientists, I mean, pro probably including myself, I wouldn't necessarily know, but sometimes scientists, you kind of end up adding fuel to this fire, which I want to say a little bit about in a minute. Yeah, so, so you say that we need to bring up these underlying assumptions, but I imagine that many people are not aware that they have these assumptions. Like yeah. Politicians. I think so, yeah. They want to solve climate change, but they don't know 
climate change. Yeah, and that's why... That, it's, that they're not acting because of... Ill will. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And that's why I think it's important that people, academics, people who study this stuff, like me and you, start, you know, doing this work. Start writing these things in the media. If we see these assumptions out there, bring them out in the open, question them. So uh, I, think, I think it's super important because they kind of, they also, you know, they shape our reality, right? And, um, and if our reality is kind of funneled, then there's a lot of possibilities that we won't see. And I think that's the most important thing about this. So just to say, again, I'm not trying to, you know, this is a good colleague of mine who works the same department of mine. It's just to say that sometimes this is super complicated. So here he's actually saying that um, he regrets something that he stated in the media earlier the same year. It was an analysis of by the what's called the Economic Council, the Ökonomiske Råd in Denmark, which is kind of an institution that advises politicians on decisions around economic efficiency and stuff like that. So they had made a report saying that if Danish agriculture, so exactly this op topic that we're talking about, if we you know, tax Danish agriculture, give them a CO2 tax or a methane tax or a greenhouse gas tax, I think they say between 70 and 80% of production will move abroad. Exactly what we were just talking about. Only they forgot to mention that the 70 and 80% are predicated on the fact that the Paris Agreement is not met. So again, exactly what we've been talking about, right? Up there in Danish media, someone, I think a journalist, or maybe they found out themselves, they realized that, whoa, whoa, this was actually only part of the story, right? And we had that debate about the assumptions. And my good colleague here came out and said, oh, I was too fast. Definitely, it could be between 30 and 80%, depending on what happens with other countries' regulation, right? Which is a much more you know, open and, and optimistic story about what could happen. That maybe the, you know, the, the leakage would only be 30% and not 80. So, so I think this, this stuff matters. It has direct political consequences to you know, decisions that we're making in Danish political debates. I'm gonna jump over the last two examples we can discuss them maybe if there's time and just give you a brief. Yeah. Uh, I've heard a lot about the Paris Agreement and the countries that signed and the countries that haven't signed. So, and what will happen if the goals are not met? But what happens if <coughs> countries that have signed the Paris Agreement just don't comply? Yeah. Well, there... presently they don't. The, are you asking if there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a mechanism? Yeah. No. I mean, in the end, we can hope that the U.S. gets a new president and then team up with China and then they're going to go out and rattle the saber, right? And say, okay, guys, comply. Because <laughs> there, no, there is no super national entity that can do that. Having said that, all nations require help from other nations, right? In so many things. To receive their, you know, citizens if they want to go on a business journey or vacation. Um, in terms of international trade, uh, monetary collaboration, whatnot, right? So definitely collaboration can be imposed, but there's no political will right now to do that. And if you look at, do you know Climate Action Tracker? Some of you do. There you can see what countries uh, have pledged to the UNFCCC, and there you can also see what their current policies look like in terms of emissions and then they've summed it up on all countries and you can see that with the current policies we're heading towards around 3.54 degrees with the in NDC so the nationally determined contributions that you send in to the UNFCCC we're heading towards 3.5 3.2 um, so countries have promised too little and they're not doing what they've promised you could say right so definitely there's a need for more leadership if we you know Want to um, want to you know uh, avoid too much uh, global warming? Okay, so just to sum up here, climate skepticism 2.0 or denialism, whatever you want to call it, right? Downplays risks and challenges associated with this issue, <coughs> and closes down debate about what is needed and what's possible. Needed, Lomborg, possible. Those examples that I gave you, gave you here, and we see this in relation to risks and cost continued growth in wealthy, wealthy countries. Wealthy countries who are already taking up a hugely disproportional share of the global 
budget for emissions, for materials, for land footprint, for anything, still think that they need more growth and more consumption and more stuff. It's, it's really outrageous, right? Um, instead of scaling it back a little bit and letting other countries use some of that budget, right? Um, the glossing over of the dire need for wealth redistribution to nurture global collaboration. Unless we think, you know, unless our model of political change at the global level of geopolitics is that a sovereign such as the US will come out and enforce this stuff, then the only way that we can induce that collaboration, I think, is by leading the way, right? I mean, how else? Sharing our technologies and being generous. Um, and in sum, this creates a false sense, I think, of security, and it curtails the imagination of possibilities for action. So some people, when they see Bjorn Lomborg writing, they're like, okay, it's not that bad, actually. Whew, growth will come and save us technology. It's, it's gonna, you know. Um, and this impetus on growth and the lacking idea, that, the lack of the idea that global collaboration could be possible implies that there's so many solutions that we'll never get to because they're just, you know, you know, they're not on the table. Potential solutions, right? And that's a problem, you know, when there's no indication that technological innovation alone will do this. We're going to need technological innovation, but we're also going to need other measures. All right, sorry, this took a little longer than it should, but um, it's also the first time that I've been giving this talk, so it was difficult to know exactly how it would pan out. Any questions? Yeah? If we create, a, if we create a society and an industry around green technologies. Wind? Wind technologies. Oh, green. Green. Sorry. In general, in the wealthy countries, and then we export those to the poorer countries. Don't we even strengthen the, the inequality we have right now? Yeah. Yeah, that could be the consequence, you're right. But also remember that, you know, there's so many people saying that technology will do it, right? But look, just look at Denmark, one of the most technologically, you know, uh, advanced countries in the world. There's technology everywhere, Wi-Fi, we can do everything, right? Yet we have one of the biggest carbon footprints globally. And I think that's one of the very good arguments for why technology won't do it alone. We need regulation, right? We need to make sure that technological gains in efficiency are not just used for more consumption. Like when we get better mobile internet, we all start, you know, watching movies on our phones, right? Thereby creating a demand for more server capacity somewhere. So, um, but you're right. I think we should create green technology everywhere as much as we can. And then we should generously share it. And we should start discussing global redistribution, right? Because if we don't do that, how are we going to ask poor countries that are, soft, that are struggling with enormous problems of poverty and, 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 and whatnot, right? How are we going to ask them to prioritize the global climate while we still fly to Thailand on winter holiday? I don't see it happening. I just don't see it. Okay, I know I was a little provocative here. It's because it's spark and we can, you know, we don't have to be constrained by any academic, you know, footnotes or anything. But if there's anything I've said that you want to know more about, or want to fact check me, shoot me an email and uh, I can share these. Uh, I might take some of the media photos from Denmark out of the slides because I don't want colleagues to feel too provoked if I'm sharing slides saying, you know, my colleague was wrong here and stuff like that. But otherwise, I'm very happy to share all the slides with you. So. Okay. Thank you, Jens. Thanks. And Jens, I like a lot that your main conclusion was like, we need more people like you. Because this is what all this program is about, to educate you and also other people to like do something and be aware of what we can do. And while I was sitting there, it struck me that I normally buy a present, some chocolate or something for our speakers, and I'm sorry, I completely forgot that. <laughs> I will come by your office no, 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 it's good for tomorrow or something. <laughs> Okay, so there will be a short break, um, five minutes, and then uh, Katrine from Climate Kick and me will give a little speak about something, and after that there will be a dinner and some food out there. I don't know if they turned up yet. We'll see. Okay? Yeah.